You're going to see it. Oh, oh. the time is so on. We're going to call this meeting to order. We're beginning with the Committee of the Whole this evening. Uh, Alderman Moyer. I would like to make a motion to approve the remote electronic attendance of 2nd Ward Alderman David Parker, 3rd Ward Alderman Mike Wendt, 4th Ward Alderman Dick Potter, 6th Ward Alderman Kevin Schoonmaker, 7th Ward Alderman Mike Waldron, Alderman at Large Sonia Bird at the Committee of the Whole and City Council meetings of May 19th, 2020. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Moyer, a second by Alderman Williams. Uh, you know, I can't remember. There's never any discussion on this one, is there, Dirk? Oh, I'm asking it. Um, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. Thank you, Alderman Moyer. The next item are mayor's board appointments. I would like to uh, recommend the reappointment of Jeff Nelson to the Board of Fire and Police Commissioners for a full three-year term to expire on May 31st, 2023. Motion to approve. Move to approve. <clears throat> Second, Parker. I have a motion from Alderman Schoonmaker and a second from Alderman Parker. Is there any discussion on this recommendation? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. Thank you very much. Are there any questions on the agenda this evening? We have no agenda items this evening, so we're going to move right into the information. And I would like to begin this evening with an introduction of Martin Vonix. And I want to confirm that when I give people the correct pronunciation, it, it rhymes with Phonix. Is that right, Martin? I think you're on mute. Do you need to unmute him? Where did he go? He wasn't on here. He's... How about now? There you go. We can hear you now. Thank you. Is, yes, is... you pronounced it correctly. Thank you. Phonix, okay. So now everybody in the community understands it's bonics. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're, we're just so pleased to have you be a part of our team. Um, just to give a little background, you're, you have over 30 years of experience in the industry. Um, you are a trained city administration uh, person. What's the, um, the degree that you have? I have a master's in public administration. Thank you. And yes. uh, and has a wonderful uh, experience in economic development, which I think really serves our community well at this time of the I-74 footprint redevelopment. And so I just wanted to introduce, um, and would you prefer to be called Martin or Marty? Marty, yes, Marty. Marty. So I yeah. wanted to turn it over to Marty, just so he can tell us a little bit about himself and what his plans are when he first arrives here next week. Well, first of all, thank you, Mayor, members of the city council, the city team and residents. I am truly excited to be part of the city of Moline team and I'm delighted to be here with you tonight, uh, even though it's from di a long distance away. Um, I think it was really interesting that a news item announcing my appointment said that I was a New Yorker. And I think I'm not going to ask for a correction because I'm not a New Yorker. <laughs> I'm a Midwesterner and a native Illinoisan. So I'm happy to say I'm coming back home to my home state into a region I'm very familiar with. You know, my goals are really ultimately to serve you, the mayor and city council well, but more importantly, it's my intent to serve the community Moline and its residents in a way that makes them feel safe, comfortable and happy. And so as I embark on this new adventure, as I come to the community next week, I'm eager to meet the staff, get engaged with them in dealing with the many challenges that we face in the next several months and over the next year. I know there's a lot of things that we have to do with the budget. Uh, this pandemic is something new that uh, no one has ever dealt with. I see so many great economic development opportunities in Moline, and so I'm really excited. So I'm gonna keep this short once again. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to the City Council. I look forward to seeing all of you in the next coming weeks. Well, thank Any questions? You. Are there any questions for Marty this evening? Just a big welcome from all of us, Marty, from both the council and the staff team. We're just thrilled to have you be a part of it and looking forward to getting to know you better. Um, we, we did issue a press release today, and I don't think that we sent that to the council, though, did we? 
It's all right. Sorry we'll, about that. Well, we'll send you the press release so that you've got the information, um, if not this evening, tomorrow. So everybody's got it. So moving on to the next guy. Oh, and Marty will be in town next Wednesday. It's his first day. So he'll, yeah. be, he'll be engaging either um, through video or in person, depending on how we're doing health-wise. Um, so the next item is uh, from Jonathan Fox, who I believe is remoted in, um, to give us an update on 2312 Fifth Avenue. Or is it Brad that's going to present? Next one Amy down. Saunders is on there as well. What? I've unmuted those people. Hi, Amy. Uh, is John unmuted? Yeah. Yes. I'm, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you, John. Hi, Mayor. Hi. So, um, John, are you the one that wants to give us the update, or would you prefer? Oh, there we go. Sure. Can you hear me? We can hear you, and we can see a slide. Okay, super. Well, thank you for the opportunity this evening, and. Um, wanted to have been working uh, with Amy and Brad with regard to issues that have arisen at 2312 Fifth Avenue, which is a property or building that most of you are, or all of you are familiar with. We were, uh, in February of this year, we were attempting, or I was attempting to get a deal put together with the owner of the property, which is Vanch LLC. And there was a memo circulated that provides a little bit of background information, but Vanch LLC is an Illinois limited liability company, and it's, man it's based out of Galesburg. And their manager is a gentleman by the name of Colwinder Cower out of Davenport. Mr. Cower is represented by a local law firm, uh, the, the Pepping Firm in Silvis. And I had a few very short conversations with his attorney but we were unable to get to any resolution, specifically a deed in lieu of foreclosure that would provide for a, uh, a, a quick claim or a deed to this property, premised mostly upon the fact that the city has a, uh, a recorded judgment against this property for code violations that exceeds $48,000. We were not able to get a deal or a resolution put together outside of court in February and in March, we started to put together the necessary documents to file to file a foreclosure. And as all of you probably know, in, in mid-March, the court system, by and large, has stopped processing or at least hearing things. And in working with Brad and Amy on this property and, and, and our options, the idea came up during one of our conversations that we should consider or contemplate in lieu of foreclosing on this property, which by our estimation would result in the city getting a, obtaining a deed to the property in approximately six months. That it may be more beneficial to the city to, instead of pursuing that deed directly, putting out an RFP that would assign our lien rights so again, what we're talking about now is a lien that's worth, a judgment lien that's worth at or about, let's use round numbers, $50,000. Put that out for an RFP so that we could see if any developer, commercial property owner, contractor, somebody with the knowledge and expertise and experience to really do something with this building would be interested in taking our lien rights and doing two things. One, foreclosing on the property through our lien, and two, curing the code violations and hopefully rehabbing that property. So the idea here is not completely different than what was contemplated originally through the foreclosure, but instead putting it out for an RFP and the, and the winning bidder here would be obligated to timely pursue the foreclosure and then once they obtained that deed, rectify the code violations and again, hopefully improve this property, make it a cornerstone of, of that block or neighborhood. So we put together uh, a quick PowerPoint presentation 
And again, Amy and Brad have been great here. Um, and what's being proposed on the second slide, um, again, tells you that we have lien rights, and those lien rights can be foreclosed. What we're, part what we're anticipating here is, or what we're suggesting, is that the minimum bid, and I know this sounds like an oddball number, would be $601.50. And that is the amount of a small weed abatement lien that the city has. The other obligations a successful bidder here would have would be not only to, again, timely move forward with the foreclosure rights, timely address the code violations, the city would maintain authority and control over the situation in that we would have the ability to participate in any settlement discussions that may arise after that lawsuit is filed by the successful bidder. And furthermore, the city would obtain reverter rights in the subject property should uh, should the successful bidder fail for whatever reason, either in the foreclosure or in remedying the code violation. So it's a little bit of a unique situation, but again, I guess the most simple way for me to put it to you is what we're proposing or suggesting is slightly different in that we would put out for an RFP to someone who would have to go through the foreclosure system on, on their own doing, and quite frankly, on their own on their own nickel. Now, the next slide we list some of the advantages here, and and I think the first one is the most important. And what it's what we're saying here is doing it this way. We think we're going to be able to gather information very quickly as to what level of interest there is in the subject property. And I I don't want to mislead or or be overly optimistic. We may put this RFP out and based on any number of factors, may not receive any or at least any satisfactory bid. But we think getting that information now, as opposed to after we've obtained a sheriff's deed through our own foreclosure action, may be beneficial. Let's gather the information now through this process. The other main advantage here is it would allow, again, whether it's the uh, a developer uh, a commercial property owner, someone with that expertise, someone with that knowledge and, and an entity that's been involved in projects like this before to get involved now. And the city at that point would not be taking deed or title to this property, but we get the experts in more quickly and more timely. Uh, other advantages include, again, that there'd be a minimization or reduction in expenses. And again, the city would retain a financial interest and be a participant should there be any settlement. And again, there would be a reverter to the city should the bidder fail, again, either in the foreclosure action or in the code or in the property rehab or, or rectifying the code violation. Um, the next slide is admittedly a, an estimated timeline that Brad and Amy and I have put together. But we think this could move forward relatively quickly with a few variables and, and unknowns. Specifically, we suggest that this would be published if agreed upon uh, on May 27th. We'd extend out the typical RFP deadline, which I understand is typically 10 days. We'd extend it out to June 17th. And the reason we'd go a little longer is we think the bidders would want the opportunity to both involve their counsel and to look at the building to figure out and to, and to see what's needed. Those bids would then be due on the 17th of June, opened on the 17th of June, and then Amy and, and Brad and I would be committed to bringing our uh, proposed RF, I'm sorry, the proposed RFP responses to council for review and or approval on June 23rd. We would then suggest that we'd have meetings and, and have uh, the agreement for the assignment of the lien signed prior on or prior to July 3rd. That agreement for assignment would be brought back to council again for approval by July 14th. Then on the last timeline or, or, sheet or uh, uh, PowerPoint slide here, we would want the uh, award of the RFP to the firmer individual, that letter to go out by July 24th and then we would give that for the successful bidder 30 days from there to get the foreclosure on file. And then our estimate is that that foreclosure action 
to be completed on or prior to March 1st. And that's where we really have some wiggle room and some uncertainty. These foreclosure actions can take various amounts of time depending on a number of factors, one of which is what level of court services and what level of operation is the Rock Island County Circuit Court going to be, have over the coming month? month. Uh, but one factor we do have in our favor is we're prepared through, uh, through the efforts that we've put together to provide the successful bidder with an affidavit that says that this is an abandoned property and satisfies the code requirements to shorten the foreclosure redemption period. I guess what I'm telling you is this March 1st timeline or estimate is subject to some variables, but I think it's realistic. And that would entitle us then on March 1st in spring of 2021 that that bidder, having gone through the foreclosure process, the, the idea here is that entity or individual would be motivated to pull the permit and get the within 60 days and to get the work completed. So, again, there's some advantages to this. There's some benefits to the city. But I really think the most important, too, are the ability to gather information uh, to see who's interested in that property now as opposed to after we take deed or title to the property. And, two, to get an expert, someone with the ability, the knowledge, uh, and the wherewithal involved with that property sooner rather than later. And that's, that's the basis for what we've, uh, we've come up here, come up with here. I know it's a little different, uh, but I think there's some real advantages here. And quite frankly, other than the wait time between now and when the bids would be due, I don't know that there's really any downside for the city. So with that said, I'd open up, I don't know if Brad or Amy, if you have anything at, at all to add. No, I think you've done a good job of explaining that, uh, John. Thank you. So in case you didn't hear that, for the people remote, Brad doesn't have anything to add, but he complimented John and his performance. Uh, Amy, do you have anything you want to share with us? No, I don't have anything to add at this time either, unless there are questions. Thank you. Are you looking for a motion from us? Oh, no, this is just information. Okay, Alderman Potter, did you have a comment? I do. Um, in, uh, in this uh, information gathering uh, timeline, or, uh, um, are we, uh, you talk about um, rectifying the code. Would it, demolition, I'm assuming, is not being anticipated, or would that be uh, uh, one of the remedies that might be available? And the reason I ask that is that uh, um, I had heard before that there's interest in this property and uh, one of the interests was to demolish the building and put in service park and I'm not sure that's exactly what the council goals are. Alderman Potter, this is, this is Jonathan Fox. The, the plan that we have is open for bids that would include any range of uses for the property and those bids would be subject to the city's uh, selection of the bid it prefers. So at this point, the idea was we'd offer any and all bids or any and all uses or plans, but with the understanding that it's the preferred outcome here that the property uh, uh, would be rehabbed and, and, and put into into use again. But we didn't, we, we don't, what we're proposing here is it, it would be open to any uh, potential use whatsoever. It, it, it's not limited whatsoever, I should say. Alderman Wayne. If I could have a quick follow-up. Yes. Um, I, I'd just like to remind the council that this uh, was actually areas part of the Lakota study, and uh, one of the in, um, ideas was that this would area would have a... Uh, uh, an urban feel similar to what we're talking about in the I-70, closer on the uh, west side of the I-74 corridor. And um, I, I think that, you know, that's something that we uh, we want to strive for. We want something similar in use like this rather than some uh, 
surface parking or something else. So if, if we're going to head down this path, we want to make sure that that's, that's the preferred outcome. Thank you. Alderman Lentz. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, I I think uh, this is a a great proposal. I think it's a it's a a, a good way to to look at this. Um, uh, I agree with uh, Alderman Potter that uh, uh, you know surface parking is probably the the last thing that we want to to, to happen here. But by getting uh, uh, all of the options out, we'll kind of understand and may, maybe. Uh, the, the property can't be saved, but maybe one of the proposals is somebody wants to come in and put a two or three story, you know, uh, um, office on the first floor or retail or, or uh, a restaurant on the first and, and residential above. Uh, I, I think we'll have a better feeling for uh, what those options are. Uh, the only concerns I guess I have is um, uh, the, the time frame. I know that, you, that it was mentioned that uh, 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 we'd have, I guess, 20 days. Um, my only concern is that that may not be enough time if somebody was going to uh, uh, analyze the building, kind of put their numbers together and figure out what their uh, proposal is going to be. Although um, maybe we're just looking for general idea and then it comes back to the council and then we try to sharpen the pencil before we award uh, the, uh, the RFP to someone because I do like the idea that um, you know, they're giving us a proposal. We say, yes, you, you, but you have to do all of these things. And if they don't, then it reverts back to us. Uh, but if they do, then we may wind up with exactly what we want uh, down on that, uh, that corner. So I, I support this. Uh, just uh, want to make sure that uh, we've got enough time frame so that the RFPs are, are useful to us or uh, we manage the expectations of what we're looking for in that time frame. And, and Alderman Went, this is John Fox here. Quick, quick question. I want to make sure I understand uh, the 20 the day period that, that concerns you, whether it's enough time. Which, which period are you talking about? I, I apologize. Well, I, I think that it was something um, like the RFPs would go out and that uh, they needed to be back. Uh, I, I think it's the slide before this is uh, the. Uh, 17th or May 27th and to uh, June 17th. Uh, so that 2021 days or whatever that uh, uh, um, time frame is. Uh, I, I just know that we historically, when uh, Ray Forsythe was uh, running things for some RFPs, um, uh, one of the things he said was, well, sometimes that the RFP uh, time frame was too short. Um, it would eliminate some people because they're trying to get their numbers together. Um, and, you know, if we're asking too much. So I, I guess the, the biggest issue, of, if it's just 20 days and we're just asking for a general RFP that we're not getting down to uh, nitty gritty numbers, you know, I think that that can easily be done in that uh, uh, 20 day time frame. If we're looking for, hey, this is. Uh, uh, pencil sharpened, and uh, this is exactly what we're going to be doing with the budget and, and, and all of those things. Uh, that may be difficult for some developers to um, uh, put together in in that short a time frame. But again, that's just from some of the comments that Ray Forsyth had given in the past. Um, uh, it, it may be something where maybe we talk with Sally Heffernan or uh, Marty as he comes on board on what that time frame uh, might be. And so I, I'm open to if, if the suggestions are uh, that we can do it in that 20 days, terrific. But uh, I also want to give you guys enough flexibility that if the, uh, the economic development uh, folk come back and say, hey, we need at least um, six weeks for these people to come back with, with something we want to look at, uh, that that time frame is, is able to be adjusted. And, and Alderman Wendt, thank you. And, and again, this is John Fox. I, I would uh, tell you that we struggled, well, not struggled, but we initially only had a 10-day period in there. And as of early this morning, we kicked that uh, submission deadline back to provide for roughly that 20-day period for exactly the same reasons you're referencing. So 
I guess my thought is I would rather see us extend, um, provide for more time if, if, if the council thinks it's appropriate, because I think it is going to be important here that the proposals, or I'm sorry, the bids that we receive, although they not, may not be with a exactly sharpened pencil and down to the exact date or dollar, I do think we need some level of, of detail here uh, so that the council can make a decision as to which proposal it wants to accept. Um, and I also don't want that period to be so short that we scare potential um, parties off. So I don't have a concern if we wanted to, or if the council wanted to extend that uh, to be longer than from May 27 to June 17. It would mean these other dates that follow in the estimated timeline would also um, have corresponding extensions. And on the script, on the slide that's before you now, I believe I would point out that we, we're proposing a, a June 17 um, response deadline, and then that we would get back with our proposed um, with the proposed responses by June 23rd. In extending that June 17th date, which again may make all the sense in the world, would would also continue that next date out. I think at least a couple weeks, because I don't believe there's a meeting. Uh, if I remember what Amy told me on June 30th, so we'd probably be out uh, a couple weeks there. But again, there's there's valid reasons for extending a couple of these deadlines. Um, I, I think there there are very valid reasons for doing that. Well, with that said, I guess I, I would move that we, we accept this proposal with the one caveat that uh, you guys talk with uh, with Marty and, uh, and Sally and uh, 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 lean on them to whatever that time frame makes most sense. And we, we uh, give you guys the flexibility to, to stretch it out, shrink it, wh whatever you think is, is uh, most appropriate and, uh, and move forward with this proposal. Is there a second to that? Great. I'll second it. Second. This is Park. Sorry, Alderman Parker. Alderman Moyer got in ahead of you. So we have a uh, motion by Alderman Witt and a second by Alderman Moyer. Is there any discussion on this motion? Hearing none. Oh, Do we have something there? Sorry, Alderman Burt. No, I was just getting ready to say okay. aye. Okay. All right. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? <laughs> That motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you to the entire team of working on this project. I think it's going to turn out well eventually. Okay, the next one is uh, KJ is going to present to us the CDBG COVID-19 proposed activities. Uh, Don brought up, is that the slide that you wanted, KJ? She's muted too. Oh. Yeah, just one second, KJ. There you go. We can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Good. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mary. Thank you, Council. Um, as you know, two meetings ago, we talked about some proposed activities for the COVID CDBG dollars from round one. Since then, uh, we learned that they have done the allocations for round two. Unfortunately, we did not receive any money for round two. Uh, most of the people in Illinois that received it are up in the Chicago area. So like Davenport didn't get any and Rock Island didn't get any either. Uh, but there is a round three. But unfortunately, that money doesn't have to be obligated until 2022. So we have some time to anticipate hopefully getting some additional funding. Um, but with that, with that being said, I listened to the suggestions that council made to me at the last meeting. Since then, I've talked to the Moline Housing Authority, I've talked to Project Now, I talked to one of the townships, and I talked to the Salvation Army. And so I'm coming back to you guys with, with some additional proposals. So how will we propose to address COVID-19 doing it with shelter assistance, food assistance, technology support, business retention, education, and money to run the programs and administration. Don, can I have the next slide? Thank you. 
And just to remind you of the allocation amount, uh, we got $478,057. Uh, still a couple questions that we don't know. Um, if the COVID dollars are going to interfere or be counted towards the timeliness test that we take at the end of October, uh, where we can only have one and a half of our allocation between our current allocation and the COVID allocation, so the timeliness to kind of spend the funds. They have not answered that question yet for us. And then we don't know if any money is received back, whether it's gonna be counted as program income. And then if it is counted as pro program income, whether we have to use it on other COVID-19 related projects. So those things are still unknown, but we are still trying to get answers to those. Don, can I have the third slide, please? Okay. So again, uh, shelter, uh, we're still proposing to use money for emergency rent and utility assistance. Um, and at the amount of $200,000, uh, probably in the last three and a half weeks, I've had 70 calls, 70 calls for rental assistance and utility assistance. Uh, we've sent out applications and I'm trying to process those applications with the current money that we have in our fund and then less on to hopefully Salvation Army who will run this program for us. Uh, they probably have ran maybe five or six rental programs for us through the years in the last 10 years. And we're hoping to continue on and have them run this one with $200,000. Uh, food, Alderman Parker, you pointed out, hey, can you guys give some money maybe to a shelter? And we looked at that possibility but we think a better route to take maybe is to give out food vouchers. And we're hoping to lean on our townships who already give out food vouchers to kind of support that program for us. Uh, so we're, we're suggesting 15,000 for that. And then Mayor, Mayor Akery brought up the technology support. There's a lot of underprivileged individuals in Moline who do not have access to the internet. Now, the one that you're looking at right now is proposing $100,000. When we get to the second set that I sent you that has a very small print, and I apologize for that, uh, those dollars are gonna be increased because up until the last minute of today, it's about five o'clock, I was working with Project Now on getting numbers to also serve Head Start and to serve the seniors in the community as well as the Moline Public Schools. So um, we're hoping to do all that uh, with bringing in broadband and being partners with Mediacom and Genesil Cable, as well as Moline School District and Project Now uh, to bring technology into the homes. And then for those people who do not have devices, we're hoping to uh, provide a device for them to use. Um, with the technology, the broadband, we're hoping to pay for the subscription service for 12 months for them. Uh, we are checking with HUD to see if we can pay it all up front, which is more beneficial to us because one, you've used the money, but then two, you don't have to recertify the income after six months. So we're waiting to get that final answer from HUD on that, but we're hoping to do it for all three of those groups. Again, Moline School District, doing it for the seniors and doing it for Head Start. Can we have the next slide, Don? So when I talk about income, you know, when I say uh, low, moderate client and the income, this is just kind of a reminder of what I'm talking about, like uh, uh, the number of people in the household. You can see if we go down to the 80%, that's the max that the household can make. So when we, all of our programs, like for the food assistance, for the shelter assistance, and for the technology through broadband, these are the income level income levels that they have to meet. So I just kind of put that in there for information. Don, can we have the next slide? Okay, catching up with you on my computer. Um, and then we're gonna suggest to keep money in there for business retention, doing a small business loan. Now on the new revised slide, I think this one was decreased down to, I wanna say $80,000 to kind of uh, relieve some money for or release some money to do all the broadband that we want to do. 
but that would still give us uh, 16 business loans at 5,000. Uh, we're proposing that those loans, again, would be a forgivable loan at one year. Uh, the next thing that we would like to do, suggest to do, is education. I think uh, we have to continually educate the public, the community, on COVID. So we're going to reach out to the Rock Island County Health Department, as well as the uh, CHC here in Moline, and then ask them to help us support that cause by doing some public service announcements and some other media campaigning regarding COVID-19. And then the last thing that we're proposing in our slides, in our program here, is uh, having dollars to operate the program, uh, to run it. Uh, every year, HUD allows you to keep up to 20% of your allocation. Uh, we're under we're under the 10% here, so we're not asking for the, the 20%. Uh, I think at last meeting, we had it like at 75,000. Heard some concerns about that, so we have reduced that down. Um, so we're trying to get a lot of things out there to address COVID. Um, right now, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for us with this funding. Um, we know that we didn't receive funding for the second allocation, but hopefully we can receive some additional funding for the third allocation. If we, maybe if we can show HUD how well we're running our programs and how we reached out to our partners to help us run those well, help us run those programs and connect with the community, I think uh, would be a good thing for us. Uh, so if I have council's direction tonight, Don, is it possible to jump into the other presentation so we can bring up the, the other slide? I just kind of want to counsel to see the dollars that we were talking about as far as when it comes to the broadband. Uh, like I said, Moline Housing Authority did reach out to me today. They want to ensure that their students there that are in school will have the resources to uh, have the e-learning in the fall and possibly for summer school. And I said, well, as long as they're included in the numbers that we're getting from the Moline Public Schools, the broadband is included for them. Um, it's our understanding with the Moline Public Schools that um, they already have the technology devices. They already have a tablet or a Chromebook. We're in the uh, Head Start. They do not have a tablet necessarily, but they might have one in the household and not need one. And some of the seniors might not need one, but we have budgeted dollars if we had to buy them a tablet for Head Start as well as the seniors. But we're hoping that all the Moline students have their Chromebooks to do their homework and do their research on. So in the other slide that I sent to you guys, the other presentation I sent to you with the tiny font, and I apologize, uh, that was a last minute thing once I got the numbers. We do have money for to address the $10 a month for the broadband for each household, as well as if we had to buy devices for Head Start and the Senior Center. And we're doing that all within the allocation that we're receiving in the first round of COVID. What's the, do you know off the top of your head, KJ, while Don's looking for that, uh, what the amount was that you had allocated for the technology, the digital equity? Uh, I, I, I can read you in the numbers. I didn't add it up. We have 60,000 to pay for the subscription for 500 kids at Moline Public Schools. I know we had a range of 300 to 500, but we just went with the highest number. Um, and then in talking with uh, Mr. Ford at Project Now, um, even though they have 558 seniors that they serve, uh, he gave me a number of 77. He said they reached out to him and a lot of the seniors said, spend that money somewhere else, it could be better used. Uh, some of them might be apprehensive about new technology and learning how to operate it. So we rounded that number up to 100, and then he gave me a number of 60 for um, the Head Start children. So after talking with them this, him this evening, we just decided to allocate for 200 kids, 200 people. So between the seniors and the Head Start, we came up with a number of 200, and then I supported 200 devices at $200 each 
uh, for them to use the broadband and to pay for the subscriptions. What was for 12 months? What was the total? Uh, let's see, we have 60,000 for Moline Public Schools uh, for the Senior Citizen Program, 12,000 for 100 people, Head Start, 12,000 for 100 people, 20,000 for laptops for the seniors, and 20,000 for laptops or Chromebooks for Head Start. So 20, 40, 64, 124. So I think, well, I mean, not to nickel and dime this, but that, that seems high because isn't that, are you saying Chromebooks for every senior and every um, Head Start? Is that right? Is that what you proposed? Well, that's how we're planning it. I don't think it's going to come out to be that way. Uh, we just thought it was better to be safe than sorry. Um, and that money that is not used for that can be reallocated to something else through a substantial amendment. So but I, that way we don't, we don't I, fall short. And we didn't know if it's nine ninety nine for the, uh, the fee every month, if they were going to have uh, surcharges or additional taxes that makes it like $15 for the month versus nine ninety nine. Uh -huh. um, I, I, I mean, I, I, my, my personal reaction is that we don't want to inflate those numbers because we're giving up in other areas by doing that. And so I would, I would cap it at a hundred thousand and just say, you know, this could be one configuration and then we don't have to worry about a substantial amendment because I think that's probably richer than it needs to be. When I talk to the school district, they thought the 500 was probably high because they've got households that have more than one kid in it that don't have access to internet. Does that make sense? And so we were double yes. counting some households. And so I think to say the high end is probably extreme. And I think that when they were throwing out that number, they were thinking of the Coal Valley kids too. And they understand that those would be restricted from this program, that it would just be the Moline um, footprint. And so I, I, would, I would recommend an adjustment of giving that money back to the small business loans and uh, restricting okay. the digital equity project to 100,000, but that's that's my opinion. Alderman Parker? So, yeah, I agree with you, uh, Mayor Acree, but also I had a question about Head Start. I'm not real familiar with it. Um, what ages are those kids? I, I believe it's preschool, isn't it, Mayor? It's zero uh, to five. It's it's babies too. And one of the one of the unique things about that Alderman Parker and talking to our project now director is that a lot of those kids are in the households of elderly grandparents. And so it's kind of an interesting combination. Um, and that's what brings me to sorry to glob onto your your statement. But I, I'm thinking that for because this digital equity thing is um, kind of new and we're talking about introducing it into households that may not have been exposed to internet like the the folks that you were talking to, KJ, where they're like a little apprehensive, that I like the education component, but not for COVID-19. I like it for using uh, digital devices because I see it as an opportunity for our elderly residents to get health care that they need. Now that telecare has become, you know, a reasonable thing to do, those kinds of things that are really important for our seniors to have access to. Alderman Parker, sorry to take your time. Go ahead. No, it's okay, Mayor. You can Again, you're the mayor, you do whatever you want. Oh, really? However, um, my question is, um, so it's age birth to five, you said, uh -huh. for Head Start? At age six, or whenever they go into kindergarten, they're gonna be, um, it, they will be issued a Chromebook from the schools, um, unless there's already one in the house for a kid that's kindergarten to fourth grade, correct? In which case, my understanding is, we went through this whole process last night at the at the housing authority meeting from um, fourth, I think it's fifth grade through senior high school. Each kid gets their individual Chromebook and they get a couple of them throughout their um, school career. Prior to that, each household that has uh, a kid in it from kindergarten to fourth grade, they're issued one. I believe that is correct. Is that right? Um, I don't know that for sure. I, I haven't talked with the school district. Well, I, I think it is. I think it is because okay. we, we, we covered that last night. Um, so I guess my question is um, a couple fold. One, these kids are going to be getting their, their Chromebooks by the time they're in kindergarten anyway. 
Um, I'm not so certain that there's a, I'd be questioning the huge amount of, of educational value um, prior to, um, you know, using a computer at the age of two or something. I, I mean, I, I've got a niece that's two years old, and uh, I wouldn't say there's a ton of education that goes on when using um, uh, technology. Um, I'd rather see those funds directed to our business retention because these people are in dire shape right now. They're still not able to open on a regular basis. And Lord only knows when that's actually going to happen. Um, the second part of my question to you, KJ, is um, it's an important one, and I'm trying to remember what it is, so I'm stalling here just a little bit. <laughs> Do you want me to take but, some of your time? Because I'm going to argue against your first point. Okay, well, that's a, well I'm okay, go ahead. to remember what he's going to say. My argument against uh, why we shouldn't just dismiss the younger students is that their access to alternative means of education and exposure is very limited at this time, even more extremely limited than it was before. And I envision any of these tablets to come to those families with Moline Public Library cards associated with them with that application already involved and so that those kids have access to our wonderful, you know, reading, online reading that's available through our Moline Public Library system. Alderman Parker. So, um, but if they're in Head Start, they're already getting a uh, certain level of education that they've been getting all along. I mean, uh, the, up until the point in time we decided to put a computer in a two-year-old's hand, right? Uh, I think a lot of families do that. Okay. I, 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 I'm not saying they do or don't. I'm just wondering where that money is better spent. I'm not saying it, it's, it's wasted on these kids. I'm just saying we have businesses that I'm not sure are going to be able to reopen unless they get significant help in order to do so based on what's taken place. Um, you know, a lot of the payroll um, retention loans and things like that through the government are super restrictive and a lot of people have not been able to take advantage of that. My other point or question that I had, which I think um, I just remembered, is that this is just a one-shot deal. So we put a computer in a kid's hand or an elderly person's hand and we give them a hot spot for a year. After that year, we're not going to be able to help them again. This is not a sustainable model, is it? Or are we planning on putting that in our budget ongoing? So they're going to, so, okay, I'm, a, I'm close to an elderly person. My wife would say I am an elderly person. You give me a computer and a, an internet access for a year, that's great. If I can't afford it in year two, I just got a computer that I'm sitting there playing solitaire on because I can't afford internet access. Unless we're going to make this a sustainable project, um, I, I struggle with the fact that we're going to provide all this to them for one year and then pull a plug on them and say, well, I'm sorry, you're going to have to figure it out from this point going forward, unless we have a plan. I haven't heard that plan, I don't believe yet. Well, and my, my response to that is that although this isn't a, a forever plan, I mean, that's not what we're voting on tonight, is that we're going to do this forever. It is very COVID. Um, there, there are things happening in our in our community that are very COVID related that these this type of investment would address. One is that people are struggling to get their unemployment um, insurance. This is a means for them to get that. They can't run down to the unemployment office and, and get ready access to it. It's a serious problem right now. And if anybody has applied for a job lately, I bet you they didn't apply in person. I bet you they went online and applied online. That's where all the jobs are listed. And so all of these families that have these children in it can also use this internet to apply for work. And that is something that is, is um, that, that problem is accelerated and more impactful at this time than it will be in a year. Alderman Wynn. KJ, I just want to make sure um, in the PowerPoint presentation, it had like $100,000 was going to be able to service 200 families. Um, and then on this one, the $60,000 was going to be able to do 500 families. And I'm just, I, I just want to make sure that I understand what that difference was um, and how we got from it costing $500 per family to now costing $120. What are we, what were we including in the PowerPoint um, uh, calculation that we're not including 
um, on this one. I think in the original PowerPoint, we were looking at buying the hotspots. And this uh, $500 number, we're looking at paying just for the broadband. So $10 a month, so $120 for each one of those comes up to 60000 Okay. So it'd be the 12 months at $10 or nine ninety nine uh, for the broadband charges. And like I said earlier, I believe Moline Public Schools already, those children already have their devices. So the, the $40,000 would cover Head Start and seniors, if you guys want to move forward with that. Um, that would cover their devices. And then the other 24000 that's uh, allocated for that would cover their service fees. Alderman Wynn. So I, I, I think, thank you for that clarification. I, I just, I, it was just a, a, a large difference in the number of uh, uh, impact. Um, I think what I'd like to do, based on uh, some of the comments that the uh, mayor made and, and some of the comments that uh, Alderman Parker uh, made, is uh, maybe uh, I'd like to kind of shoot in between and say, uh, let's amend this uh, and uh, lump the technology in at 90,000. And then uh, the uh, X, this is my amendment to this plan, is uh, uh, reduce that to 90,000 and the remainder amount uh, be dumped into the uh, business uh, retention portion. Okay, so that'd be about 34,000 going back into the business retention. Yep, okay. that's my motion. I, I don't know if oh, anybody's okay. gonna second it, but. <laughs> okay. I'll second that, Parker. We have a motion by Alderman Went and a second by Alderman Parker. Is there any discussion on this? Alderman Went. And, and part of the reason uh, of that is, you know, there was just some some comments, one about the number of households that it's going to hit, uh, that the number we got included Coal Valley kids, uh, that when KJ was going through the uh, number of seniors and Head Start, uh, that it was like 77 here and 60 there, but we had budgeted for 100 and 100. Um, I, I think that, uh, um, uh, over budgeting for what the uh, possible need is um, uh, when we've got limited funds and we've got uh, uh, need for uh, some of these immediately for some of our businesses. I think this is a um, maybe a good compromise uh, that I think we'll still be able to cover uh, what we were intending to do with you know the 500 families being able to hit with the uh, $60,000 um, that if we're able to not submit this as each one of these as a line item, but uh, technology support in which we will do, you know, one of these four or five things, and that's what the uh, uh, the ninety thousand dollars will be used for. I think is uh, uh, is probably a better way to go. That will, that way we don't have to do substantial amendments and in, in those sorts of things and uh, uh, use this uh, money as soon as possible. And I so think, then, I think the phrase in the in the country right now is digital equity instead of technology support. So I think everybody, I like the industry understands that to be what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, I can certainly switch that. That's not a problem. So then the 90,000 would cover, it's all encompass. So it would cover the service fees, it would cover any uh, devices that we had to pay for as well, correct? I think that's the motion, KJ. Okay. It's just okay. allocating 90,000 for this this digital equity program. And then depending on how many households are impacted, um, there'll have to be some decision-making of, of, you know, okay. when you run out of money for households, uh, then you don't have as much money for the devices. Okay. Still Your ahead. Honor. The oh. Go ahead, Jeff. Your Honor, this is Jeff Anderson. Do you mind if I uh, add a comment that uh, may have some bearing on uh, what Alderman Went just had to say? Please. Um, I, I think it's a very good idea, and we have been looking at this as a holistic technology. HUD uses the term uh, broadband approach. Um, when it comes to submitting this to HUD, and what you will probably see coming from staff to you uh, we will be required most likely to break it down into three components of seniors, of youth, which are the school age, and then for children, which would be the head start or not yet in school. 
and those are the qualifying program matrix code designations that uh, we are obliged to submit this to HUD. So I think we can deal with it kind of as a larger program, um, but it will come to you as at least three separate funded activities. Within those activities, and KJ uh, uh, and Tara uh, could agree or disagree, but I think that the numbers would be such that hopefully we would not have to do a substantial amendment if we found the need to transfer funds, but could do that as an administrative amendment without uh, crossing the thresholds we pre previously discussed. That's not a promise, but it's my gut feeling. And uh, uh, anyway, just wanted to throw that in so there's clarity on that. Thank you. Jeff, is there a reason that you have to declare what category? Why? Because we're not declaring that category for our business support, and we're not declaring um, seniors and school age for the rental program. No, those are, that's a very good question, thank you. Um, those are individual activity categories, each with assigned um, matrix code. Uh, however, when it gets into um, uh, the, uh, the support for the seniors, youth, and uh, children, the service, public service categories that this activity would fall into that we've been able to match thus far breaks it down by age as opposed to just general broadband. And we can follow up with HUD to make sure we're not missing something. And again, KJ, correct me if you've seen something otherwise, but that's how it would be presented to and qualified for HUD's purposes. Anybody else? Alder Ms. Kuhmaker. Same, same topic uh, under this, but just a little, little unrelated. The KG, I think you were going to put fifteen thousand dollars into food vouchers. Is that the right number? Correct. Could we just make that money available to the couple of food pantries that are in Moline, or is that going to be an issue because they don't? They don't identify income of people that come through the food pantries. I'd, I'd prefer not to run it through another layer of government. And, you know, the township is not going to necessarily move things along quickly. So is that not possible to do the food pantries? No, because with the food pantry, you know, I have to make sure it's a Moline residents who's getting the, uh, the food, and then I would have to okay. make sure that they meet the income. We're okay. right now the townships are already handing out food vouchers. Alternate idea, can we, in our in our efforts to work with the schools, can we provide the food vouchers to the school system for their folks that are already on the low or the free and reduced lunch, that they could hand those out to people that are already qualified so they don't have to go through a whole lot of paperwork and they can get them right out? Uh, you know, that's, that's always a possibility, you know, based on uh, how they do the income certification. If they provide us the list up front, we can mail them out from here. Um, but yeah, we can certainly work with the school district on that, how to frame it. I'd, just my voice, if anybody else wants to add anything to that, I, I think that could be maybe a little, a little better than working through the township and the extra hoops that that will cause. KJ, there's not a problem with having multiple um, ways to get the food vouchers out, is there? No, we just need to frame it and you know have an understanding of it that we can explain to HUD, just to make sure that there is not a chance for misuse of the, the vouchers. Thank you. Alderman Parker? Yeah, KJ, um, going back to the, uh, what did you call it, broadband equity? Something like it. Um, yes. for, for anybody that, um, if you start running low on, um, as you're identifying households to um, uh, get these uh, internet access and Chromebooks for, um, if any of those include housing authority houses, uh, we do have housing authority money from the CARES Act that we could help subsidize. I don't want, you know, in our process of supplying it to everybody, I don't want to I want to make sure that we supply it to everybody. 
and we don't run out. I mean, I, I'd love to, I love, like the idea of moving some money over and to help our businesses, but there is another fund um, that uh, we, haven't we haven't identified how we're gonna use it um, um, through the Housing Authority. So stay in touch with uh, John Afoon at the Housing Authority in case you need um, some extra funds in order to complete this project. Thank you, Alderman Parker. Like I said, I had a short conversation with him today I know we reached out to HUD because we did get some rental assistant request uh, applications from some of the people living in Moline Housing Authority to help them out with their rent. And HUD did rule that we can help out the Housing Authority uh, with these federal funds. Another thing that HUD did tell us with the funds uh, uh, for the emergency rent and utility assistance, unfortunately, we cannot pay water bills to the city of Moline since we own the company. But we can help them with their gas and electric and we can help them with their rent, but we can't support their water bill if they're delinquent. KJ, can you address your um, intention to provide more COVID education? I, I understand that that um, that is important, but it feels like that's so well covered by other entities that are better at that kind of education than we would ever be. Would you would you consider doing some other type of education like the digital equity education? And I'm thinking we could like the librarians would be a wonderful resource to help facilitate people getting access to um, things through a digital means that they maybe aren't used to doing. Would you consider doing something like that for education instead of COVID? Oh, absolutely, Mary. That's a very good suggestion. There's a lot of people who don't have comfort when it comes to using a, a tablet or a Chromebook. You know, I'm still learning every day, but I try to do my best. I depend on YouTube. No. Uh, but no, we can certainly look at that, and maybe reallocating either five or 7,500 of that uh, for that purpose. Um, I would have to work with Jeff and uh, Tara to see if we're paying for salaries, then it's a different approach that we need to take versus paying for the, the class itself, if you will. Because like with the uh, Rock Island County, you know, we're, we're paying for the PSAs. We're not paying people to put them together. So I guess we're paying for the advertisement so we don't have to worry about uh, prevailing wage or anything like that with the dialectors. But depending on how we want to set it up with the library, um, I just need to take a look and uh, have a conversation with staff and possibly HUD to make sure we're, we're moving forward accordingly. How much are you guys suggesting to be reallocated maybe for digital education? Well, I was suggesting the full amount because I don't yeah. think it would be prudent to for us to fund additional COVID-19 education just because I think there's so much information out there already. Um, so, and if not the full amount, uh, I don't know, $10,000 and have it be staffed from a uh, city staff, then we don't have to worry about prevailing wage and then use the extra five for business support. That would okay. That's so take out COVID sense. education altogether. Okay. I, I mean that's my recommendation. I don't know how the rest of the council feels, but I feel like there's some great educational um, already. All sorts of really slick advertising and and social media and print. You know, it just feels like it's everywhere right now. So I think that we have a, a we have a motion on the floor for the the adjustment from the um, 124,000 to the 90,000, and then transferring that balance over to the business loan program. Is that correct, Alderman Wynn? So that motion's on the floor. I think that was a standalone. Do we want to take a vote on that? Um, is there any other comment regarding that that switch? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. Just for clarification, KG, KJ, in the um, proposal that you have, those are loans, right? They're, They're forgivable loans after one year. So I wouldn't be in support of that. I would rather have it flow through the system and reuse it. What's the rest of the council? 
feel. Alderman Wynn? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I think that they need to be tied to some, um, uh, some requirement to stay in business, stay within the city of Moline, uh, stay open for uh, an, a, a number of years. If I, I would, I would prefer that there's some kind of payback for it, so that we can recycle it, and, the, and then we have this fund of, of money that we can uh, continue to um, uh, encourage more business development and, and all that stuff in the city of Moline. Uh, but I would be willing if maybe, you know, uh, after, you know, five years, it's it's forgivable, or after three years, half of it's for, forgivable and the rest it needs to be paid back. I, I don't I don't want to burden them with too much of a of payments coming right out of uh, uh, of COVID, uh, they're already going to be probably cash strapped and, and cash flow uh, is going to be difficult. Um, and so um, if there's a way that we can do it um, in which there is some payment of it, if not all of it, um, uh, and those uh, um, requirements that they have to stay open and stay in with, within Moline, because I think that there's some neighboring communities that have uh, gotten themselves in a bit of a pickle where they've given out money to um, uh, places that just then aren't opening up or are even moving to other uh, locations and uh, it was just money that they they gave out the door and uh, I'm not sure if uh, the city's going to get the benefit that they were expecting. Alderman Parker. Yeah, um, I, I like the idea of trying to retain some of it, but it's, since it's HUD money, Originally, are there going to be strings attached to how we can reuse that money, KJ? That's one of the questions that has not been answered for us. We certainly have asked that question to HUD, but they just have not responded with an answer to that yet. If we treat it as program income and it comes back to us, does it have to go into another COVID activity or does it have to go on to the same COVID activity? or can it just go into any CDBG activity? Uh, we just don't know the answer to that yet. KJ, could, yes. could we propose that it flow into the revolving loan fund program? Can we propose that it flows into that? Yeah, when they pay it back, it just goes into our standard revolving funds for loans. Uh, Mayor, I would have to get with HUD on that because, I mean, with your revolving loan fund, I guess the criteria is, is not the same right now. So if you if you give me time when we write up the proposed use and bring it back in the, uh, in the policies and procedures, maybe I would have that information at that time. Because, uh, I mean, we're looking at the revolving loan for a model. We're looking at the way the Davenport's doing theirs. And then we have another entity that we're looking at theirs and we're trying to combine it for the best use for Moline. Uh, but I think that's a great suggestion and I wouldn't mind looking into it for you. Thank you. Alderman Parker, I'm sorry, I think I interrupted you. <clears throat> sorry, you're on mute. I know, God, I hate that. Um, I, no, I just wanted to be sure that we weren't gonna loan all this money and then have it come back to us and we don't know what to do with it. Um, you know, we've had some of those projects before that, um, you know, we, we just, we got to do something with that. I just want to be sure HUD's clear, uh, direction is pretty clear as to um, if we do receive back that, but you've already covered that. So KJ, if you could just find out for us, I'd appreciate it. I will work on that tomorrow for you. Mayor, may I clarify something? Uh, Thank you. Janine so has a clarification. So when Alderman White was talking about that. Um, Can you all hear Janine? I'm sorry. So, Alderman, when you were talking about the um, that possibly at least half of the loan might be forgiven if the business remains in Moline, are you talking about a specific period of time? Well, I, I think the idea is I, I think I would prefer that it needs to be paid back. But what I was just uh, trying to indicate was if there wasn't um, support for that, uh, that 
we would uh, um, have some other kind of uh, where a portion of it would be forgivable and the rest paid back. Because I think that there is some some benefit if, again, HUD will allow us to do it, of recycling these these funds to continue to give uh, benefit to our uh, our businesses, uh, much like our revolving revolving loan fund. Um, I, I'm not sure if a year is a long enough uh, period of time for us to really understand if this business is, um, you know, stuck around because we don't know what, where, or what we're going to be uh, at in the uh, in the you know within the next 12 months uh, with with the COVID thing. So, um, uh, yeah, that period of time I, I think is is up for a discussion. I know our other program. Uh, that we did was was a longer period of time than uh, just one year. And if we're asking for payments back, I think it needs to be a longer period of time because otherwise you're just asking them to cash flow a, a, a loan back right when they're trying to get back on their feet. And so, you know, whether that needs to be a three or, or five years, which our, our other program is, that's what I would prefer to support. But again, that comes down to what KJ can get from HUD on what would be acceptable. So KJ, the sense I'm picking up from the, from, well, my, my opinion and the council people that have spoken is that, um, I think we, we feel pretty good about the loan program that we established for COVID-19 with the, um, five year payback. I, I think that I can't remember if it was no interest or 1%. What did we end up one, at? It was 1%. 1%. 1%. And so maybe it would be an option to, um, I think the 1% was meant to keep people aware of it, but I think it would be an option to have it be 0% on this, but have it be structured that way. That seemed to be really attractive to people. I mean, there, there may have been some people that didn't want it because it wasn't a grant, but there were a lot of people that did want it. Um, and I think those people are the people that intend to keep, to pay it back, so. Can you well, we can certainly take a look at that and uh, kind of model it after that, if that's the council's direction. Um, you know, Jeff is uh, Jeff Manus is working with us on this, as well as Tara and Jeff and myself, and uh, probably a few others. Uh, but we can certainly take a look at that model and see if we need to tweak it at all for the CDBG sense or not. But come back to you guys with the ad information and our policies and procedures if you guys approve a five-year loan. So what I'm hearing, you want it to be a loan and not a grant and not a forgivable loan. You want the money paid back. Is that correct? Does that misrepresent anyone? Alderman Schoonmaker? Oh, sorry. Alderman, I, Alderman Schoonmaker. I think, it would be, I think it would be good to clarify, um, you know, in the, the directions for the program, uh, if they've already received a grant from the city or a grant or a loan, because we've done a little bit of, of both here, um, to make sure that, you know, it's clear whether they're eligible or not. And I'm, I'm not suggesting necessarily one way or another. I probably am favoring the side that, that they could do this, you know, that, that, that they could still apply for this because it's a separate fund. But I think we should clarify that in the directives. Mayor, one thing that I just learned is that our revolving loan funds are no longer tied to CDBG HUD. So if money comes back as program income, we could not uh, commingle them with the revolving loan fund. Well, we could if they're willing to release it. So uh, what difference does it make to HUD if we're giving it away or if we're taking it back for another purpose? I think that needs to be clarified. I don't think it would have to be for COVID purposes in five years or- Okay, so keep it COVID and not just revolving loan, okay. No, 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 no uh, that it wouldn't be COVID in five years. I'm assuming the impact of COVID-19 in five years will be resolved, I'm hoping. Okay. <laughs> and so I think the proposal, what we're asking for direction on is can we, can we have this be a loan program and then reuse the funds in the future for economic development, uh, small business support? Is that acceptable to HUD at this time? Okay. That's our what we're posing to the HUD. Does the council agree? Are you okay with that direction to KJ? So I think we are looking at that and we aren't talking about a ton of loans here, you guys. We're talking about um, maybe uh, 10, no. 
five thousand dollar loans and we're looking at i'm sorry how many 16? we're looking at about 21 20. once we add that other twenty four thousand in there because right now we have 80 uh so that gets to 16 then you add the other 24. Yeah. so right around 20 20 loans um Do you need a vote on that, KJ? Well, tonight I kind of wanted to get your direction because moving forward, um, then I need to put this into a plan and have a basically a seven day comment period, two days for HUD and five days for the public. And then based on that, then I'm gonna come back to council so you guys can improve the final plan and take it in consideration any public comments that we receive and then we'll send it up to HUD for final approval. So right now tonight, I just kind of wanted to get a feel of what you guys wanted me to put into the plan. Mm -hmm. And then based on that, we'll put it in the plan. We'll have the uh, uh, public comment period and then we'll come back to council in June for final approval to send it up to HUD so we can get the programs in motion. So your proposal, you've got 200,000 in for rent um, support You've got about 100000 in for business if we transfer that over. Is that the right split from council's perspective? Do you have any feedback for KJ on that? Everybody okay with that? So is, can, I, can I just get some motions so we formalize this? Can I get a motion on the amount for a rent subsidy? Uh, KJ is proposing 200000 I make that motion. We have a motion to support that by Alderman Moyer. Is there a second? Second. We have a second from Alderman Berg. So we have a $200,000 rent subsidy program. Alderman Parker. Um, I'm taking it, and I haven't read through any of this, but I'm assuming that the rent subsidy would um, not be eligible for Section 8 housing folks because they're already getting a rent subsidy. Well, HUD did tell us that we can pay for, uh, we can help support Moline Housing Authority, so. Um, well, I would rather help the residents than the housing. We have, we're, we're doing fine right now. So um, I would rather not support, um, you know, to, to help fund the housing authority. We got, we have residents out there that are really hurting, that they're the ones that need these funds, not the housing authority. Okay. And I, and I say that because I'm on the board. So um, I do have a little bit of uh, expertise on where we stand financially as a board. Does anyone have a conflicting opinion on that? So, um, Dave, I, or Alderman Parker, I just want to make sure to clarify and, and that I'm understanding it. So you don't want to help Moline Housing Authority residents, but we can help sex, those that have Section 8 vouchers? No, no, the Moline Housing Authority, my, Moline Housing Authority um, residents and Section 8, I, I think should be excluded from rent subsidies because they're already getting a rent subsidy. Um, Section 8, you know, is, is, by definition is a rent subsidy. So okay, um, I, I don't want to give, I don't want people making money on the deal, basically. No, that, thanks for clarifying. Yep. Yeah. So um, can I call for a vote on this particular part, the rent subsidy? All those in favor, please indicate um, support of 200,000 rent subsidy that will be um, restricted from Section 8 and Moline Housing Authority. Aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. So we're buttoning this up, KJ. It's just kind of All stupid. right. <laughs> I know. So now, now let's, uh, I'm looking for a motion that um, takes into account that KJ's got 15,000 set aside for education for COVID-19. Um, if any of that money you want transferred over into the business loan or yeah, business loan program, however you want to state that. So we're over like, we're probably at like 110,000. Alderman went. I'll make the motion that we transfer 10,000 for um, uh, technology education and 5,000 into the, uh, the business uh, retention uh, bucket. So the total business retention bu bucket is now uh, 109,000 and then you've got the digital education at 11, no, 10,000. Is that right? We were at 80, uh, 80, 90,000 for the loan program already. I mean, for the technology program already. And then we added 24,000. And now we're adding another 10,000, correct? 
No, you're moving yeah. 24,000 over to the business loan. And that's, at, okay. so it's 80 plus 24 plus, uh, Mike just suggested an additional five. So it's, it's 109. Can you say six just to make it easier? So it's not a weird number. So we don't have... <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought he was huh? So move. It's 34. I'm sorry, so move to what? <laughs> oh, we did move 34. So oh, so it's 120. So we were down to 90 in technology, and now you're adding back. Dirk is working with the numbers here, and so <laughs> he's going to come to the podium and tell us what, what Mike wants. So, we, starting with the 124 that KJ presented this evening, Alderman Wendt successfully moved at 34 over to the business program, so we were down to 90 in the technology. Now, you've asked to move money from... Um, what is it? To education. divide up the COVID-19 training. Right. And five of it to go back to technology, which will move the technology piece, the equity. It's the opposite. He said mm -hmm. 10 for the technology education. Uh, digital equity. Then that brings us back to 100000 on digital equity. Well, yeah, if KJ will leave it loose like that and have the training. Can you leave it loose like that, KJ, or do you have to have training in a weird separate bucket? We're probably going to have to have training in a separate bucket. Okay. So I can, I'm asking when to do the split, though, at 6 and 9, so that you end up with 120000 in the business loan program. Uh, so moved, 6 and 9. <laughs> so so the motion on the floor would put 120000 into the business loan program. Do I have that number right? I'm looking at Alderman Moyer. No, I think you do. Okay, 120,000 in the business loan program, 9,000 in an, a digital education program. That's the motion that's on the floor right now. Uh, you need a second. And we've got second. a second from Alderman Moyer. <laughs> Sorry, you got Alderman Moyer in there. So we had a motion by Alderman Wint, a second by uh -huh. Alderman Moyer. Is there any discussion on this topic? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. And then we've got an allocation for administration. Do you still feel comfortable with that number, KJ? Yes. Do we want to do a motion, Alderman Schoomaker? Do we, can we get um, an idea of the time frame to implement rolling this these funds out? And is there anything uh, we can do to make it easier for you to roll them out? Is, we hope my to point have these is, rolled out. Oh, they need, they, my point is, we should do everything we can to get them out quickly. How can we help you get them out quickly? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, like I said, our next step is to have the public input comment period and then come back to council. We'll come back to council that first week in June and ask for consideration at the Cowan Council. And then the next day we'll electronically submit it to HUD. Typically HUD has up to 45 days to approve a plan but they know when it's coming in as a COVID substantial amendment, they're given consideration to it earlier. So they're not wanting to take the 45 days because they understand the rush. But you have to understand there's a lot of people submitting at the same time. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna get it to us as soon as they can. So I don't think it's gonna be the 45 days. We'll probably hear back within probably two, two weeks or so from HUD. Okay. So hopefully by, uh, sometime late june right before fourth of july we're ready to roll these programs out in the meantime we'll work on the environmental so staff get those out of the way um and be ready to go get and we'll work with dirk on getting a, a sub recipient agreements put together for our partners to sign and kind of framing up how each program will work you know who's buying what who's being reimbursed for what things like that Okay, well, just, just so we're applying as much urgency as we can, obviously, you know, the sooner we get this out, the better for the businesses and the residents. Yes, we'll come back to the first meeting in June as uh, the anticipated time frame that we're working within. Thank you. Do you feel comfortable with the direction from council, KJ? Yes, I think it's been a very healthy conversation <laughs> here tonight, so I appreciate <laughs> the time. Thank you, KJ. Thank you for working with us on it, letting us be a part of, of how you've designed this. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, moving on to the next informational, we have Chief Galt presenting the U.S. Department of Justice Bulletproof Vest Program Grant. Thank you, Your Honor and Counsel, and uh, welcome, Marty, to uh, Moline. Uh, I just wanted to give you uh, an update that we have applied for the U.S. Department of uh, Justice Bulletproof Vest Grant Program. Those of you that have been involved in uh, the Council have seen this uh, on, on an annual basis. Um, uh, state law requires that the law enforcement agency in the municipality provide a bulletproof vest for every law enforcement officer in the agency and that we replace it uh, when it expires. Uh, we already budget uh, for the matching funds uh, every year for this, and this is a 50% matching fund uh, grant, so uh, we'll be trying to replace 32 vests in a two-year period. Do you need a motion? Approved. I don't, I don't think I need a motion for that. Oh, thank you. It's just informational. Do you have any, anyone have any comments or questions for Chief? No? Thank you very much for bringing that forward. The next item is the Illinois Liquor Control Commission Tobacco Enforcement Program. Chief. So this is also uh, something that many of you see, have seen on an annual basis. The Illinois Liquor Commission provides funding for us to uh, do retail checks of uh, tobacco retailers to make sure that they're complying with state law. And as, as you know, we've talked about before, uh, tobacco and underage uh, abuse is a problem. And uh, so these funds allow us to check 48 of our retailers in the city of Moline uh, three times, and it also includes education packets uh, for our retailers. This is a 100% funded uh, by the Tobacco Enforcement Program. There is no matching funds. So just uh, alerting you that uh, we're applying again for this program, uh, and we'll be moving forward with our, uh, our, our plan to again uh, enforce and check our tobacco retailers in the city of Moline. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have the next item is the e crash option for completing and filing crash reports. Dirk Price. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I sent you the memo. Uh, we analyzed where we've been with e crash and uh, what it could possibly do in terms of some administrative costs and savings going forward. The negative deleterious effects of e-crash, that is that they have the subscribers, the chiropractors, the lawyers, who uh, automatically get the report, that's happening anyway, uh, because they submit FOIA requests to us that we fulfill. So yes, they get the reports a little later, by a few days, maybe five days, but they get them. And so uh, to the mayor's point and your point previously as a council, about trying to prevent that from happening, that we can't stop that. Um, what we can do around that, uh, if you agree to move forward with this, is um, one, it allows the officers to key in the data and then it's keyed in only once. Right now it has to be keyed in or, or written a second time by somebody else um, and then sent. Uh, and so we avoid the second keying of the information, if you will, that it's keyed in once. Um, but at the time, of the report being filed out, a card is handed out to people who have been in the collision. And that card says that you can get the driver's information report for free from uh, Lexus, whose product this is, online. What we propose is to add to that uh, a statement that says, or you can get your full report for free from the city through a FOIA request. And I'll work with Amanda to come up with a simplified form, but any email asking for it would satisfy as a FOIA request. Um, and so reminding them they get the full report for free, what happens is that people want the full report, even though they typically don't need it as a private citizen, they still want it. And as a matter of convenience, if you want it right that minute, you can get it online from Lexus right that minute for paying the money Lexus charges. Uh, 80 to 90%, depending on the jurisdiction of who Lexus sells these reports to at full, the, the sell, sale of the full report is commercial. It's insurance companies who need it for their file. It's all the other people. So really it's only 10 to 20%, depending on where you are, uh, citizens who are asking for it. And if we put on the card that it's clear they can get the full report for free from us, I think that will save some of the heartburn that this whole setup um, goes with. They're the only certified provider at the moment for the state police, and they're throughout the state of Illinois for that reason, because it's efficient. The fill form is filled out just once, and we move on and live with the um, commerce side of people being in a collision. 
So the informational is just to go present that memo and find out if there's uh, any objection to moving forward with trying to bring you back a contract. Is there any comment? Alderman Parker. So Dirk, the, do we anticipate the uh, FOIA request going up or down? Because you know, if the if the chiropractors and lawyers aren't get, aren't filing FOIA requests, um, is that offset by the um, people involved in the accident filing the FOIA, FOIA request? Because my thought would be great if we could reduce the number of FOIA requests and reduce the the pressure on staff to provide those. So on FOIA requests, I do think that uh, that they would go down. Um, for this reason, Lexus would no longer be filing one every week, as they do. Uh, and the chiropractors and lawyers, they can do it if they want it quicker, but most of them subscribe to the product, to eCrash, and so they wait for the week for LexisNexis to get the FOIA in information from us. They're usually content to wait a week or two to send the thing out. They, they haven't put that much pressure on, so I don't think that'll change much. Um, uh, though it will, what, what marginally will happen there is it'll decrease it. And then in terms of the pressure on, uh, on staff, uh, for the private citizens who want it for free, I think that that's, I think we've signed up for that. I think we're ready to do that. Alderman Williams. Could the citizens get them from their insurance companies? That depends on the terms of their agreement with their insurance company. The insurance company pays for it from LexisNexis, so um, that's between them. They're all a little different. Alderman The problem I would see with that, although that's the, probably the best way to go about it, is that an insurance agent would just ask the person involved in the crash, hey, go down and get your free copy and bring it down here. That way I don't have to request it or we don't have to pay for it. It's an independent insurance agent or you know, someone trying to game the system. Right, the only thing that you're required to get is the driver information, and that's what you're supposed to provide to your insurance company. That is free from Lexus to you. So if that's what your insurance company said, can you get the driver's information, that comes free to you from Lexus. It's the full report with all the metrics where the officers indicated which way the cars were pointed and whether it was wet or dry and all that. It's all of that. If they want that, the insurance company's supposed to get that itself. They could and pay for it, or they could have the insurer go down, file a FOIA, and get it for free. Uh, that's between the insurance company and that. We well, they could file a FOIA and get it for free, too. True. You, so okay. there's no cash disadvantage to us because the person that's out of the cash is eCrash, and we don't particularly care about them. Chief has a, has a comment. Oh, right. Uh, Chief reminds me that, well, uh, on FOIA, we're redacting a bunch of personal information. The insurance company wants everything that's in the crash report, typically. So driver's license numbers so they can you know, figure out if the person's had their license revoked or whatever. Sure. Before. Good. Oh, Alderman went. Will this also allow us to do some more uh, modeling and figure out uh, where multiple crashes are and intersections uh, more easily than uh, what our current system is uh, being able to provide? Yeah, so over time, once we get uh, the information in there, it does come up, come with a a tool in the back end that can be used for that. Chief Gall, okay. what's your, how do the officers feel about this? Do they want this? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> There's no debate. Expand, no, expand on that. no, 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 I like, I like the succinctness of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, just trying to be brief. Uh, yes, yeah, so obviously it's a lot easier. Right now we're, we're, we're completing uh, handwritten reports, including handwritten diagrams. Uh, and this would uh, would streamline that process greatly. Uh, it, it was something I'm familiar with from my previous uh, employer. Uh, we had it there, and, and you saw in the memo, uh, all of our neighboring uh, cities have this currently. So it's it's the current technology. Are there any other comments or questions? I think you've got to go. No concerns, right? All right. Dirk and Chief are moving forward with this. The next item is also Dirk's practices and procedures for utility service fees update. Uh, thank you again. So this is an update on the council's direction uh, on the motion uh, of Alderman uh, Waldron um, concerning the payment plans and reviving the possibility of disconnection for unpaid water bills. And so under the code of ordinances right now the only entity that can sign agreements is the owner uh, and our payment 
plan procedures that we have in place are uh, involve signing by the owner. Um, the finance department has a series of different protocols, but they all involve the owner. So to have a payment plan with the tenant, we need to amend those ordinances. And so your options are, as we go forward, to amend a payment plan by the tenant, one, that we enter into it with the tenant, that they put some money down and we have the payment plan with them. We have a payment plan with the tenant with notice to the owner, or we have a payment plan with the tenant with required consent by the owner. And so those are the options. So it's in trying to write the ordinance that you asked to bring back to modify the procedures during COVID where we're um, not imposing the late fees on the water bills if they're late, uh, but did want to revive the possibility of shut off for non-payment, I need an answer to that question. Is it tenant only, is that okay? Is it tenant with notice to the landlord that there's a payment plan, or is it tenant with consent by the owner? So I have a question for you, Dirk. Is what, is it in the best, which one of those options is in the best interest of the city, and which one of those options is in the best interest of the, the renter? And which one of those options is in the best interest of the landlord? As far as the city is concerned, because the landlord is always responsible for the bill, it doesn't make a difference to the city on the financial side. But in terms of the goal of the city as expressed in trying to provide relief during this period of the state of emergency, uh, the first one, letting the tenant sign up for the payment plan, fulfills that goal the most. Uh, the one that's best for the landlord is obviously they consent to everything, um, and that goes with them being responsible for the bill at the end of the day. The middle ground, and for both the, the city, that well, the city doesn't care so much, but the middle ground between the tenant and the landlord is with notice to the landlord. Alderman Schoomaker? Uh, Your Honor, I, I like the middle ground. I think notice to the tenant, or notice to the landlord is important. Uh, gives them some some opportunity to take some different actions if they want to, uh, but it, it doesn't require their consent and lets the tenant uh, make the arrangements on their own, keeps an extra hoop out of the way. Any other comments? I see a thumbs up from Alderman Wynn. Alderman Waldron, did you have something you wanted to share? No, oh, I agree. Do you need a vote or do we have any dissenting? Anybody not want to be the middle ground? I have my direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next item is J.D. Shelty. It's the Defense Community Infrastructure Program, DCIP grant by the Davenport, or sorry, Department of Defense and Rebuild Illinois funding by Illinois Department of Transportation. Thank you, Your Honor. Excuse me, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I come before you tonight to kind of talk about uh, a funding program that has been, it, it's been in the department, it's been a line item in the Department of Defense budget for several years, and this year it finally got an appropriation uh, earmarked in there for about $50 million. And uh, earlier, I'm gonna say probably around February, uh, the mayor and I wrote a letter uh, and urged the Pentagon to come out with some guidance documents on how this funding was going to be applied and pushed out. And the guidance document just came out last week that talked about how this uh, funding was gonna be eligible and available for uh, different communities like ours that have a military installation that is kind of supported or integrated into our community. And so, um, Don, if you put me up to the next slide. So if you remember, um, our city engineer had come and talked to you in the past about the uh, 16th Street viaduct or uh, the 14th Street access to the arsenal and what we anticipated was gonna be about a $6 million repair uh, to us in the future. That's a, that's a city uh, viaduct and uh, abutment that uh, goes in there and supports the arsenal and it gives us the only access to the arsenal on the south side of the railroad tracks. So uh, we understand, you know, um, all the different reasons why it's a, it's, it's a key feature for them for, for access. So as we look through this uh, and the, the guidance that came down, it looks like the, 
the funding would be available through this uh, DSIP program, and that's um, about 50% is the minimum they would fund for these different projects that support mil military installations that are tied to different communities. And so our estimate back, I know a few years ago when uh, the engineer came and talked to the city council was about $6 million to do the reconstruction and repair work on that. And at that point in time, the staff recommendation was to hold off and use MFT funds after our commitment to the I-74 bridge uh, project for our local portion had been um, completed and exhausted in 2021. And so what we're uh, proposing to take a look at with this DSIP program now is to, to use the 50% available funding towards that six million, $6.7 million estimate, uh, engineering and construction estimate that we have on this. And then this Rebuild Illinois funding that we just became aware of here last week as well, that is the, um, is the funding that comes forward from the state over six installments over the next three years, every six months, of 2.87 million, but it's uh, gotta be used for bondable type construction or bondable issues, which this meets the criteria for. And then our, it's gonna be approximately 7% left that we would have to come up with for local funds or you know for additional to to meet meet that 50 percent match and we're recommending then using mft for that portion of it uh, rather than using mft for the whole portion of it like we talked about uh, several years ago so uh, don if you could come to the next um, slide so we've looked at uh, so we looked at this program and the different criteria that are going to come uh, to be required at this with this application and um, we had a looked at the Roosevelt Group, who helps us with the um, Rock Island Arsenal. I think it's called the Develop um, Rock Island Arsenal Development Group. There's right? a Defense Alliance, Defense. and there's the Development Group too. Okay, okay yeah. So uh, this is the person that I think it's Tim Fry put us in contact with, and we got a um, we got a um, a response back from the Roosevelt Group. They basically gave us three pages to kind of come back and and talk to us about the timeline that we need to work with and some of the different key components that, uh, that are gonna be imperative to have a successful application that comes in, you know, to trigger this funding the way they understand it. And we, we check all the boxes to, to come in with, with a highly successful um, consideration for this project. And the, um, the, the trigger for this though, to use our state funds is that we have to use a qualification-based selection process for like an engineering partner that was gonna come alongside of us for the design. So Laura and I, just because there's, um, there's no commitment or no obligation, we made the decision last week, just to, for the sake of time, to go ahead and we solicited for a qualification-based selection last Friday that's gonna take about two weeks just to keep the timeline moving so we stayed within this strict timeline I'll show you that we have to follow. So um, the uh, reason to do that is not necessarily we can use these state funds without that process, but we can use these state funds for a federal project like this without the qualification-based selection process. So we wanted to make sure we didn't uh, step forward too quick and then get ourselves disqualified for the, for this um, 3.7 million. So um, Don, you can go to the next slide. I won't go through and read all that. The Rebuild Illinois funding, and it's kind of interesting, they're, they're, they're pushing this money out quick. We actually, um, I think Carol will tell you, we got um, our first $477,000 check. Uh, it showed up last night. It, it, it came yesterday uh, afternoon. So um, it can only be used for bondable expenditures, though we can't use it for maintenance. It comes in like MFT, it comes in actually with our MFT, but we have to separate it out, show it segregated, and then it has to be used for specific uh, projects that have a 13 year lifespan or more, something you would typically typically bond for. And I, I won't go through all the, the details of it, but you can use it for development, you can use it for design, you can use it for reconstruction of roadways, major bridges, rehabilitation. And we actually went ahead and communicated with our contacts at IDOT and got uh, email confirmation back from them that they said this, this would be an ideal uh, project to try and pair up you know, with, the, with the federal funds. Um, you know, they cautioned us that if we, uh, and, and we've got another list we want to show you of, um, 
of kind of alternative projects if we weren't successful for the DSIP uh, funding where we'd recommend maybe moving uh, these uh, state funds towards, but we can't use it for any administrative overhead expenses, any repairs to existing uh, roads and bridges that aren't um, you know, major reconstruction. Uh, we can't use it for patching concrete or filling ceiling cracks, any kind of normally anticipated uh, repairs. So um, the uh, funds have to be earmarked for a project within one year of receipt, so that still meets all the criteria to pair it up with this DSIP funding. And, and Don, if you'll go to the next slide. If we aren't successful for the DSIP funding, uh, then we've already identified different projects and we'll continue to put, start putting cost estimates with these. So by September, if we come forward and, and learn that we haven't uh, received the DSIP award for the funding to, to move it towards this project, then we've already got, I guess, a list of projects that we can prioritize and bring forward to Consul, and we haven't done anything towards uh, precluding ourselves from using the state money because we only have to get started and, and get this activated out on projects within 12 months of the time we start receiving it from the state. So the reason I wanted to come kind of informationally and talk to you tonight, Your Honor, was because um, we'll, we'll probably come back to you with that quali uh, qualification-based selection um, award right around the 9th of uh, June, but I'm also going to ask you because we have to get a supporting documentation from uh, the Colonel, which uh, Colonel Marr has committed to this. He's going to hitch his wagon to this project. He thinks this is probably the best project that he's seen. He thinks it's got the one, uh, the chance for the most traction on something that it, uh, supports the arsenal and, and meets the criteria for this DSIP funding. So he's, he's um, committed to give us the letter of support that's required to go in with our packet and then we need to get authorization from the city council to go ahead and move forward and make this application. So um, I wanted to give you a kind of a heads up and make sure that you're okay with us working on it. Um, Jeff Anderson is committed to work with Laura Clower. She's connected with us here tonight if anybody had any specific questions for her, but they uh, think with the assistance of, of Tim Fry and his folks, uh, Colonel Marr has uh, offered up uh, Jonathan Ramsdale out there from his team to help us with the application and then We'll obviously circle in uh, by state because they, this is their wheelhouse uh, to make sure this thing has every opportunity to be successful and, uh, and then come back to you for that approval. Great. So, Do we have any comments from the council? Alderman Wynn? I, I love the idea of the, the DSEP uh, um, uh, grant through the, the feds to pay for half of this, but I've got some real concerns about um, you know, this, this idea, this rebuild Illinois, a lot of this is coming from um, uh, increased uh, 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 taxes on, uh, on, on fuel and, and other resources, that the opportunity costs, we look at this, what's right here, all the different projects that the residents of Moline would be able to benefit from if we are using that $2.8 million towards these projects. Uh, the 16th Street Viaduct, it, it, it's nice for the arsenal, it's convenient for uh, their people if they wanna uh, come off the arsenal or if somebody wants to go on the arsenal and, and, and miss the train, but it is not uh, for the residents of Moline mission critical to, to have it there. And so I guess what, what I would push or like to amend this is uh, that we move forward with the um, uh, trying to figure out if we can get that uh, uh, that grant, but we direct staff to work with the arsenal to find other funding sources uh, to uh, match that uh, that other 50 percent and not take away from the residents of Moline's um, uh, allocation out of the uh, the state funds. So I, that that would be my motion. I'll second that, Mike. Alderman went. We have a motion by Alderman Wint and a second by Alderman Berg. Is there any discussion on that item? Uh, Your Honor? Yes, Alderman Potter. Um, do you have any idea where that, where, where those other funds might come from? I mean, uh, I know we have MFT available. I, I don't, I, is there gonna be another grant program? Is that what you're speculating? I, I, don't, I guess I don't understand. Alderman Wint? No, I, I, I don't think that it should be coming out of 
uh, the city of Moline's uh, budget or uh, from uh, uh, taking away from projects done to the roads and infrastructure within the city of Moline, I'd be looking to uh, the arsenal out of uh, their budget or other grants or uh, federal uh, funding that they may uh, have access to um, or other resources to, uh, to make up the rest of that, uh, uh, that 50%. Now, obviously, our staff is going to be involved because it's it's uh, within the city of Moline. It connects to uh, our roads. And so we're going to wind up uh, being involved with this process. But I don't think the I think the opportunity costs are too high uh, to take uh, all of our funding from these uh, um, uh, Rebuild Illinois and our MFT uh, to just throw all at this one project. Alderman Potter, there is one funding source that I'm thinking of, and that is, uh, J.D. mentioned it, it's the Rock Island Arsenal Development Group. They have reserves of 750000 that are restricted to be spent on um, uh, things that exclusively benefit the arsenal, for the arsenal, that type of thing. And that came from a program that they had that they were doing rentals on that, on the arsenal. I think that um, there's there's some transition right now, um, but there's seven hundred fifty thousand dollars there. Yeah. Right, Potter, um, I'm 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 all for looking for alternative funding sources. I um, I, I believe that that uh, this roadway, although uh, all the men want is correct, it's not as. Uh, uh, useful to our citizens, if you will, than, than many of the other projects that are listed there. But uh, um, I, I believe we're obligated to keep this open. And uh, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to look for all those other things. I'm just not sure uh, you're going to find anything else out there beyond the, you know, what's obviously come down from uh, the department uh, for a 50 percent uh, payment of uh, what basically is a local project. Alderman Wynn? Uh, I, um, to that comment uh, that we're required to keep this open, I, I, I was told specifically from Scott Hinton that that's not true, that we are not obligated in any way, uh, that uh, our, our, we start ownership right after the exit off to um, uh, River Drive, and in fact, um, Scott Hen told me that it would, because uh, there were some discussions um, with Renew and, and different things, that it would be about a million dollars to take it down, uh, because there were some discussions on what if it came down and how would that look with the uh, historic block and uh, uh, the collector center and how that would develop if that was taken down. So uh, now I don't have any firsthand knowledge, but that was directly told to me by Scott Hinton that we are an, under no obligation that we do it as a courtesy uh, to the uh, the arsenal um, uh, and uh, um, and so there is no uh, requirement or agreement that uh, requires us to uh, uh, provide that access over the tracks and and over to Fourteenth uh, uh, and on to Fifth uh, Avenue. Are there any other comments? All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you so much, J.D. Thank you, Your Honor. And I'll, um, I'm oh. up here again. I'm going to grab some different stuff. Yeah, and now for the big one. Does anybody need a break? COVID-19 update. J.D. Shelty and Carol Barnes. Carol, I saw her there earlier. Now I don't see her, but uh, maybe she just turned off her camera. There, there she, she is. is. Hi, Carol. Hi. Are you uh, are you ready? So I guess uh, uh, Carol wanted to give an update tonight on some of the financial information that she's had coming in. She had uh, uh, more, and I can stole her thunder, I guess, on talking about the fact that we got that first um, that first round of the the rebuild Illinois funds that came in already. I know she was going to mention that to you. But uh, she had some other different funds that, uh, that came in with uh, some uh, information that we've been forecasting on so she could firm some more up. She wanted to talk about those funds with you tonight. 
And uh, then I, I was just going to let you know, uh, Your Honor, that uh, Allison and I have been working through and going through and meeting with all the departments. We still have, I think, four more meetings scheduled through uh, this week. But if any of you, I know I've been delayed on replying to emails, and I apologize, but we've been consumed with this, and we're making some good traction. So uh, we'll continue that on, and I think we actually finish up next Tuesday. So uh, with that, Carol, I'll let you uh, go ahead. Don's got your got your presentation up. Okay, thank you, Your Honor and Council. And Don, you can actually go to the next slide. I'm gonna try, or I guess you can go two in, one more. I'm gonna try to keep the update brief tonight. Um, primarily, I'm going to focus on the revenues. There weren't a lot of changes in the expenditures right now because as JD said, Allison and JD are, are meeting with various departments on the expenditure side. But we did get some good information on revenues. Again, this is very early on, um, but we did get, um, receipts on nine out of our 18 major revenues this last week. And fortunately, the amounts came in, if you take a look at the actual to the COVID-19 budget, on those 19 revenue streams, they came in in total about $307,000 to the good, or up about 2.3%, and this is year to date on those revenues. So we'll take whatever good news we get. Again, it's very early on and we're gonna be heading into some months here where I know revenues are gonna definitely be going down. So month by month, we'll continue to address this. But I do wanna highlight the good news um, for this week. And I'm gonna stick with the main revenues that are highlighted in a bright yellow. If you can see those bright highlighted in yellow for the month of May, the column for May. And the first one is, is our state sales tax. If we look on the individual month for May, we had thought on the COVID projection that potentially the revenue would come in at about 694,000. It came in at $881,000. The key thing to highlight with that, as you know, there is a three month lag on sales tax. So it's actually February numbers. And we all know that the economy was doing very, very well in February. If you move along into the June and July numbers, you'll see that COVID number, um, the projections, we are anticipating those numbers dropping down in the $400,000 range going forward. But I'm really happy to report for May that that number came in higher than what we had anticipated. Year to date, the number for the sales tax is actually up $256,000 or 6.3% over what we had anticipated for COVID. If you go down to the home rule, you'll see also that the numbers are up. They are not up near to the degree that the state sales tax is, but we'll take it up whenever we can get it. It's up about one and a half percent year to date for a total of just shy of $50,000 for our home rule sales tax. Again, going forward into the, to the June and July numbers, we anticipate those will most likely be dropping. The next two categories of income tax and the replacement tax, this is our corporate income tax, um, actually are slightly lower than where we had estimated the COVID-19 coming in. So Keith and I um, tried to do some investigation on why in the world that that is down, because a lot of this is going back to the year 2019 on some of the income tax filings, both for individual and corporate. And what we were giving um, the explanation for is that because the, the federal government did that 90 day extension for filing your returns, we are seeing some people, they're not paying their taxes due. Um, they did not pay them in April and hopefully we'll be seeing some, a little higher numbers coming in for June and July. Yeah, June and July, which will hopefully even that out. And roughly those numbers year to date for income tax, they're down about three and a half percent and about 4% on the corporate income tax. So again, I'm hoping that those come back in line with, with what we had estimated for the COVID-19. The utility taxes, um, this is another one we are down year to date. We, we are um, 
down also for the current month of May. We're down about 6% for the year. And as we've talked before, one of the reasons that this can be down is due to the climate. We had a very warm winter, so people weren't spending a lot of money on heat. And now it's been more cool this spring, so people may not have turned their air conditioners on yet, as well as some of the businesses that may have been closed and not using utilities like they normally do. So we'll continue to watch that. The next one is our local use tax. It's been pretty level. Carol, oh, I, I, got a, I got a quick question. When you say we're down 6%, on that, is that 6% from what you had budgeted or 6% down from what you, the presumed COVID amount that we would be collecting was? The COVID, it's oh, down okay. the COVID amount. So we're, we're down quite a bit more than that from what we budgeted? Yes, yes, it's okay. down even more. It's down okay, I just, I just wanna make sure, cause it, it kinda sounded like we were only down 6% from what we had budgeted, but it's oh, from I'm what so we sorry budgeted. If I did that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. No problem. The next item that we received revenue on was our local use tax, and that number's been pretty flat. You can see for May we got 108,000 in versus the 105 that we had projected for COVID. Overall for the year, we're up about 5%, 5.6% or about $36,000. And the state had told us that they anticipate that that use tax should stay pretty level and strong throughout the next couple of months. So we're gonna keep our eye on that and hope that that comes to be. And Don, if you can flip to the next page, we've just got a couple more here that came in. Our biggest one here is our motor fuel tax. We were extremely pleased. If you take a look at the, the May receipts, we got $128,000 and we had actually budgeted only 40 for the COVID. Early on, when we talked to the comptroller's office, they had anticipated that there would virtually be no travel. People are truly not spending any money on gas travel at all. And that doesn't appear to be the case. Um, so again, we're very, very pleased for year to date. We're actually up 141,000 or 24%. Um, compared to where we thought we were gonna be for the COVID-19. So we're gonna continue to monitor that. If we head into the summer and those numbers turn, you know, continue to be strong, that's one that we may come back to you and say, maybe we actually amend the budget up for that for COVID-19. I don't know, but for now we're leaving everything, everything the same. The last two I'll mention is the video gaming. We actually had anticipated that there might not be any video gaming here for the month of May. And we actually got in $18,000. So um, that was a nice little up. Um, it's actually up 32% uh, for the entire year. So the money on the gaming is coming in. And then the last one is, is a small amount, but it's the cannabis. And originally we hadn't hardly budgeted anything for, for cannabis. And it continues to, to come in. It's a little under where we had projected. We had projected 3,000 across the board. Um, so it's down a little bit here for the month of May, but it's up about 1.2% for the year. So anyways, we're real pleased right now for May that we're showing strong numbers. Again, it's about $307,000 total on those nine revenues. But for now, we are um, recommending that we hold tight with that $10 million uh, recommended shortfall in our revenues. One last thing I wanted to, to talk about on the revenues Keith and I, we also took a look at the water user fees and our sewer user fees, just to kind of see where they're coming in at. And for the four months ending April 30th, we virtually build the same amount of usage for those four months as what we did in 2019. So the billing amount was the same for usage. It was about 0.4% off, so it's virtually the same. However, we are showing that our outstanding accounts receivable on those accounts is slower than what it was in 2019. And we know that that's probably due because they're not required to make payments. We aren't putting on penalties and delinquency charges. 
nor are we doing any turn-offs of the water. Right now, we're about $144,000 stronger on the accounts receivable, meaning we have a few more delinquent accounts. But I'm saying them as being slower payments because hopefully once everything is listed, people will be coming in and we'll probably be setting up a lot of payment plans and that money will start trickling back in. But I just wanted to alert you to that, that it appears that the money is, is coming in a little bit slower than what we had in. I shouldn't say what we had anticipated. We anticipated that there's definitely going to be some drag down in our $10 million projections. So we're probably on course with the numbers that we budgeted. Any questions on the, go ahead. Any questions on the revenues? Alderman Lynn. Uh, yeah, so so down in in the gray down here where it says I think uh, uh, revised lost revenue and revised total lost revenue uh, with adjustments, um, are those not affected by these these updated changes we've got? Because those numbers are the exact same uh, uh, totals we had last week. What this is is kind of a running total of change, but we have not amended the budget, and we would not do that until we actually asked council if you wanted to change those original projections. As we look towards the bottom, the original amount for lost revenue that we had calculated was 10534000 And then based on the first four months of actual, it's the very next line, we, we had some downs, and then we had the big up for April, the 365000 the net change for those four months, since it was an up, was showing 329,000. Since we don't have May yet in total, we're not carrying that forward yet. We'll wait till we get all of May's numbers in. But for April, we were up 329,000. So the revised lost revenue just on just on our paper, just for talking, is the 10 million 205. And then if we add in all of the remaining revenues and all, you know, all the other um, smaller amounts, that brings the total um, down. It's another 521000 that was to the good in some of those funds. Um, so the revised lost revenue was 9.6. But we haven't revised anything. We're just kind of keeping a running total. And at some point, we'll come to you and, and ask if, if you want to revise the numbers based on several months of history, if, it, if it's showing that our, our number is a little bit different than where we had budgeted the COVID-19. So, so this isn't a running total, like uh, our total number down in the right-hand corner of the $10 million, that's not been uh, adjusted at all with the, the new data you've, you've been bringing in um, yet? It, it will, once we, once we close out the month of May, and we have all the main numbers in, then we'll show a revised total, okay. but we aren't going to update them in our in our accounting software into Navaline until we would get a nod from council that we want to officially amend it. Okay. And again, I'd kind of like to see several months of history going in the positive direction before I would consider that at this point. <coughs> any, more, any more questions on the revenues? And if not, we can go to the next slide. We spent most of the week actually reconciling all the um, spreadsheets that we had given you previously and making sure there were so many people that were entering data into Navaline. We wanted to be sure that every little thing was tying out going forward now. And we did actually find some adjustments in our CIP and the sheet that we gave you on the CIP a couple of weeks ago virtually has not changed. What happened is we did not get all of the 5% contingencies that we had recommended to council. It didn't get updated in Navaline. So I just wanted to show, as we reconcile, both things were absolutely in sync. I, I just wanted to show you the change. In addition, um, we had a land purchase it was five, the address was 520 21st Street. That actually went through and was finalized back in 2019. So I did remove that from the budget and I wanted council to be aware of that. 
so that was changing the expenditures. So I've highlighted the net changes in expenditures now is 5,739,000. And I'm not gonna talk to this a whole lot, but it's the same sheets that we've been showing you. We have the total net changes in expenditures, Don, if you go to the next page. By category, and you'll see down in the far right hand bottom, there's the new number, the 5739 updated with those contingencies and that land purchase. And as we move across and we look at the one changes by fund, again, the bottom right number, 5739 is the next slide, Don. And then we'll go to the very last page of the fund equity. It's the very last slide, Don. And again, you'll see that the total total ties out. So again, I don't have any expenditure reductions to show you this week. Um, we will hopefully here in the next two weeks when JD and Allison get through meeting with all of the departments. One thing I did want to tell you, I don't know if you've got a pen and pencil, just to kind of write this down. Um, Keith and I, we were looking at the general fund here later this afternoon and we were just running the year-to-date numbers of the actual. So through today, May 19th, if you divide May 19th, year-to-date, by the 12 months, so it's 4.61 months, or it's about 38.4% of the year has passed as of today. And again, expenditures don't come in just straight line all the way through the year. But just as a benchmark and a snapshot, just to kind of see, well, where are we at year to date now that we have reduced the budget or we're looking at this COVID-19 budget? So we took the general fund, the new COVID-19 budget, and that's the one that is in the fund equity that we just talked about. We took it times the 38.4%, which is through May 19th, and that total would be year-to-date expenditures, if it was a straight line expense, 16,685,000. That's the benchmark if we had spent it. However, <clears throat> we have only spent 15,874. So we are to the good by 2% overall and about $811,000 year-to-date. And as you know, we just implemented this COVID-19 you know, starting the end of March, the 1st of April. So when council and the mayor, and when you gave direction to the department heads to hunker down, don't spend anything, hiring freeze, no overtime and all that, the departments truly are spending the bare minimum in their departments so far year to date. Again, that number can change as we go throughout some of the months, but I just wanted to show you in a snapshot that it is good news, and I'm gonna plan to update you with those year-to-date actuals on a monthly basis. So we're absolutely monitoring this going forward, expenditures and revenues. And then I also um, am thinking that after I have an opportunity to review this with our new interim city administrator, we may come back and recommend to council to go ahead and amend the budget at this point to lock in the COVID-19 numbers so that it will be easier going forward for the department to monitor their budget. Again, I anticipate we could amend the budget probably four or five more times throughout this year, but at least if we lock down where we are so far, and then as, as we continue to find cuts, then we will continue to accumulate it, and at some point, you know, we'll continue to amend the budget. But it would make it easy, a lot easier on the department heads to monitor their budget. So, but uh, once I talk to the new city administrator, um, we will come back with a recommendation on that. And that's all I had for tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. JD, do you have anything you want to share before we open it up to questions? Nope. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, Council, Welcome. do you have any questions or comments? Concerns? All right. Well, thank you very much, Carol and JD. Thank you for your all of your team's work on this. 
Thank you. And then we'll we'll hear the next update at the next meeting, right? Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that is it for our informationals this evening. I'd now like to open it up for public comment. Janine, do we have any public comment this we evening? We did not. Okay. I do not believe we have anyone in the chambers, so we have no public comment this evening. Without any further business of the Committee of the Whole, I'd like to close out the Committee of the Whole and go into the Council agenda. And will we be having an invitation, Alderman Burr? I don't know if you have her muted or she's muted. Alderman Burr? Um, we'll assume there's no invitation this evening unless she speaks up. Uh, she's not muted. She's not muted. Alderman Burr? We're calling the council meeting to um, order, and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Alderman Burke. Roll call, please. Alderman Williams? Present. Parker? Present. Went? Present. Potter? Present. Moyer? Present. Schoolmaker? Present. Waldron? <laughs> Bird? What? Was Alderman Burr, are you present? We'll move forward. Okay. Your Honor, I request approval of Committee of the Whole and Council meeting minutes of May 12th, 2020 and the appointment made during Committee of the Whole on May 19th, 2020. Yeah. Thank you. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Parker, a second by Alderman Moyer. Roll call, please. Alderman Berg? Aye. Alderman Williams? Aye. Parker? Aye. Went? Aye. Potter? Aye. Moyer? Aye. Schoolmaker? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. That motion carries. And would you adjust our roll call to include Alderman Burke? Yes, I Thank will you. do that. Thank you. We got your vote on that one, Alderman Burke. Okay. That's all I had this evening, Your Honor. Wonderful. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, you're welcome. Um, so now we're in for council business, and I'm going to go around the council room um, and see if anyone has any business they'd like the council to address. Alderman Williams? None. Alderman Parker? I do. Um, J.D., I want to thank you for everything you've done over the last several months, um, helping us uh, you know, get through our daily business. I don't think you really signed up for all of this, but um, you know, with uh, Marty coming on board here soon, I know you're gonna be working with, with him closely. And I know that your people are gonna be really excited to get you back into uh, you know, where you're really comfortable. But, but thanks for picking up the slack and taking the ball and, and helping us carry it um, even further towards the goal line. You did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman Parker. Alderman Wynn? Uh, ditto. He just <laughs> stole what I was going to talk about. <laughs> Thanks, J.D. Thank, thank you. Alderman Potter? Uh, J.D., I hope you never come back to uh, being city administrator for your sake. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Alderman Moyer? Yeah, I'll echo the thank you as well. But, um, so I was contacted, and I know Alderman Scoodmaker was contacted as well by the owner of Susie Slots on 41st Street and 23rd Avenue. And I just got, I wanted to bring it up. He is um, looking at purchasing the Christopher D's uh, business on 16th Street and has asked, um, <laughs> has requested that he would close down his Susie Slots location on 41st Street in the Avenue of the Cities if he could transfer that to the Christopher D's location. Christopher D's does currently not have a license. This doesn't alter the number of licenses that we would currently have, but I wanted to bring it up. Um, I'm not sure uh, exactly if, if 
if we want to make a motion today, his lease wouldn't be up until November, but that's what he's going to be asking us to do. So, Alderman went. do you have a comment? Is the idea that he would move a K license down there or that it would still be a, a bar like Christopher D's and that he would trade off his, he would trade off his K license for the lower license if we would allow it. And he, he actually has a, did he talk to you, Alderman Moyer, about a second possibility as well? The, the other, the other one that's in uh, the old Kings Plaza, I believe he won too. Uh, he said he would bring that up later. So he'd like to move. So he, he, he would probably possibly trade off some K licenses and put them in places that are more in line with what the council, you know, generally believes, but that they belong in. Uh, but Dirk was, isn't there an obstacle that, that that's not allowed like beyond our approval, even beyond our approval. So yeah, the, Neither the state nor Moline's code of ordinances permits a transfer uh, from one address to another. Um, I walked through this with, uh, with you and uh, Alderman Moyer. If Christopher Dees had a license and he bought Christopher Dees, he's allowed to use that license until he gets approval from the state for that one. And so you would have actually subtracted one license from your, your total volume. But Christopher Dees doesn't have any licenses. So um, we can surmount the state one. If you were willing to have him surrender a K in exchange for the tavern license and allow him to apply to the state, you, we'd have to take an exception to the existing ordinance on the books that says no new ordinances, or no new licenses, I'm sorry. This is technically a new license. Um, but you're surrendering one. You're not increasing the number. Um, you're also not shrinking it, but you are getting rid of a K, and I know that the K's have uh, been a particular uh, source of heartburn for many on the council. Can we make an adjustment in the ordinance that, uh, because I wouldn't want to go down that path of being able to move licenses. Right. But could we make a, something very specific in the ordinance would only allow us to, from our perspective, um, transfer a license to a more favorable license well i would encourage you to be the most specific possible for the exception which would be the surrender of a k to move into a, a different liquor license establishment and that way it's the k's only if he wanted to do this a couple other places i think that what i'm hearing is that that's a benefit to the council fewer k's if these things are in actual establishments so much the better then that would be the precedent and i think you could live with that you're getting rid of the k's and letting them be where there are actually bars now. What's the restriction on K's right now? Well, it's a total restriction that you're only gonna have 30 licenses and you have, you're at 38, I believe right now, 30. So we don't have a sub restriction on the K's. We do, it's five and we're currently at eight. Okay, oh. thank you. Alderman Parker. So in this situation, we're talking about um, him surrendering his K and then, um, we would just open up the uh, bar license. Is that correct? Yeah. He, well, would we, he, he would he would qualify for the tavern license, and then right. he would get a new gaming license from us in exchange for surrendering the K. So you're not you're decreasing the K's, but you're not creating decreasing the total number of new licenses. You're still above your thirty limit. You right. Said. But don't we have people on a waiting list that, for bar licenses? I mean, that's not going to get us in trouble by pushing him to the front of the line, is it? I don't know about a waiting list. There's currently no waiting list, but what oh. one is, because we didn't start a waiting list at the very beginning, in fairness, we said it would be like we do our election process where we would allow them to come in and, um, you know, what do we call that? A lottery system. It would be like a lottery system. So I think Alderman Parker, what we're not really moving them back in the line. They'd still be in the same spot in the line. This this would just allow for a provision for a license to be transferred to a more attractive status from our perspective. I like the I love the idea of transferring it from a K to a bar license, whatever that's called. Um, I just want to be sure that we do it correctly and don't get ourselves in trouble. Are and we have to open it wide open to everybody else again. Alderman Schoomaker. 
I, I'm in favor of this. Dirk, are there any un unintended consequences? We, like, like, could he turn around and say, take that second K and sell it for a very large amount of money because he can then, he can't, can he? There's no. no there's no sale, there's no, no transfer, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. He can buy a license though, because well, that's basically what he's doing. Um, yes, but then he has to go back down state and, and apply there. Uh, and yeah. Well, I mean, he's buying out a K. He's making a K go away to give him the freedom of putting a, a, a different license in a yeah. liquor establishment. Right. Well, that's, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. He's, yeah. he's buying to get rid of it. Yeah. I would say, I'd say it's a win for the community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So should we, let's, I think that it'd be appropriate to make a motion to direct staff to amend the ordinance to do this properly. Okay, I'll make a motion that we um, direct the staff to do this properly. <laughs> there you go. Second, Alderman Schoonmaker. All right, we have a motion from Alderman Moyer and a second from Alderman Schoonmaker. Is there any discussion on this? I don't see any hands, so um, roll call, please. And that was a real motion. <laughs> uh, Alderman Burke? Aye. Williams? Aye. Parker? Aye. Wentz? Aye. Potter? Aye. Moyer? Aye. Schoonmaker? Aye. Walton? Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. That motion carries. Do you have anything else this evening, Alderman Moyer? No, just thanks for helping work that all out this week. Thank so. you. Thank you for bringing it to the council's attention. Alderman Schoonmaker? Uh, just JD, thank you, and echo the, the other comments of the council. Well done. Thank you, Alderman. Alderman Waldron? Uh, nothing. Alderman Burke? I have nothing except for ditto what everyone else said about JD. JD, thanks a, a, a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I want to I wanna say the same. Thank you so much for, Jade, for everything you've done, JD. I know it's been not only a, a difficult thing to do, but in a very difficult time. So thank you very much. And I also want to thank all of the team members that backfilled your role. We know what you do, and we know how difficult that is to pick up that slack as well. So please pass on our gratitude to everybody else that, that adjusted and morphed their positions to help us out. So yeah, that means a lot, and, and they did, so I'll pass that on. Thank you. How many people are impacted? It was like 12? Oh, yeah. 12? Yeah. Go back to your places. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And then I did want to give the council an update. We had the forward um, platform uh, got launched officially on Thursday, and I don't know if Jeff Manis is on the call, but he has received fantastic feedback, and he has done a wonderful job of navigating all that and making sure that the feedback that comes from the businesses is going to the the software developer and it is there's lots of evolution to the platform right now but it, the feedback has been very very good they're um, using it and finding benefit from it so i just wanted to share that with the council um, and then we're just super excited to have marty on board and thank you very much for joining us this evening marty and and being open to coming to Moline. We're, we're so pleased to have you. Um, I don't have anything else. I'd like to now open it up to staff. Does anybody have anything they'd like to share with the council this evening? Hearing none, I'd now like to open it up for a public comment. Is there any public comment? Hearing none, I believe there is no further business for the city council this evening. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Maker. We have a motion from Alderman Schoonmaker and a second from Alderman Moyer. <laughs> He's positioned himself. He doesn't have to say. Without any further business, we are adjourned. Thank you.